All right, so for today, um, as introduced, we are going to look at a very interesting technology called Steraris RNA Fish. And um, for today's sessions, um, we're going to share some of the exciting development and applications, particularly looking at the mRNA and RNA therapeutics development, because lots of things have happened um, during COVID. And now we are moving to post-COVID area. I thought of sharing some of those development um, with a broader audience um, in case any of you will be interested to look at um, the RNA expressions at a single cell level um, to look at the spatial gene expression data with this fascinating technology. So if we move on, again, as I mentioned, these are the core characteristics of this technology. It's again, a RNA fish, so for instance, in situ hybridization, however, it does have some unique characteristics compared to other RNA fish technologies. In the first place, it has single molecule resolutions. And of course, you can also do localization like many of the fluorescent institute methods. And on top of it, because it allows single molecule resolutions with no amplification, you can also do quite accurate quantification. So these are the three main characters for the steris RNA fish that is slightly different compared to some other technology that is available. So as I mentioned, um, we do see a lot of the RNA therapeutics gaining momentum post COVID, um, you know, both looking at the mRNA as well as the different RNA therapeutics. So here is a very busy slide, but just to showcase you know, how many emerging biotech as well as pharma company we have seen during and post COVID um, bring different novel modalities to the market that increase you know, NT-Sense, um, siRNA, messenger RNA, of course, you know, being a BioNTech Madonna in the um, headlines uh, during COVID for their mRNA vaccines. Um, there's other forms of RNAs that's been mentioned here, you know, RNA aptamers, CRISPR, et cetera, et cetera. So it is really because all this development, RNA is once again under the spotlight. And true enough, it is indeed central to um, the dogma, right? So, you know, we all understand from our Biology 101 lecture that you have the DNA goes to the RNA, have been transcribed and been translated to the proteins. And RNA is really at the center to this dogma. And a lot of people, when they're studying, you know, RNA biology, these are the three type of questions that you will usually start to ask, you know, which RNA am I looking at? And, um, you know, people can start looking at RNA sequencing um, to understand, you know, what are sort of the RNA that's being expressed. Um, we can also look at, you know, where it is being expressed. A lot of people can use, um, you know, fluorescent microscopy just to look at the location that it is being expressed. And people also wanted to understand, you know, how much it has been expressed, the quantification of it. So that is, you can use the quantitative um, qPCR methods, or even back in the olden days with uh, some of the blotting methods, which is rarely used um, current. So I would say, with all these three questions, Steraris will be able to answer all this at one time to understand which RNA, because you use very specific probes where it is expressed because using microscopy images, you know exactly where it's localized. Does it co-localize with another transcript and how much it is being expressed? You're able to quantitate um, by counting the spots, which I will elaborate more about to understand why it can be quanti uh, quantificated in this method. And then this is what I talk about, about the Steris workflow protocols that was fixation, permeabilization, then you set up the tubes um, to hybridize with overnight or with a faster protocol. Um, usually a set of at least 25 and up to 48 probes will bind to the transcript of interest. And once they bind to the same um, transcript, as I mentioned, because of the um, diffraction limit, the dots within 200 nanometer will merge as one. If you look at some of the other technologies that potentially use antibody, those are much these are much bigger than the 200 nanometer. So this is slightly different um, technologies where by looking at one punctate, 
it is a very clear indication that you got one transcript. Um, so this is what's showing about, you can go to our STARS RNA fish citation center um, to look at the publications um, and two thirds of them are in nature cell um, as well as science. We are updating this page so that uh, especially during COVID, a lot of the research interests have been on the mRNA and RNA. So we're going to update some of the exciting um, publications during this period into our new website that's being developed as well. We also have a select science web page, as I mentioned, should you wish to um, you know, look at some of the customer testimonial and their comments about this technology. All right, so this is the page um, that I was talking about you know, before uh, I changed the presentation mode. So essentially, um, so you can design your process to be inclusive or exclusive, depending on what type of RNA that you're looking at. If you're looking at general at gene level, um, you know, all the different variants that are that's being transcribed, then it's more of an inclusive process. You will probably start with um, those common, CD, um, common sequences. And, um, but if you're looking at RNA variant, for example, a splicing variant that could have very different expression, in different tissue types, and you would like to understand that, then you might want to um, have some exclusive probe sets that only target that particular variance uh, with the axons that's been included. And of course, um, you know, I will share later in the examples, uh, you can also look at some of the introns um, or maybe even some of the intron axon um, sort of junctions, um, depending on what type of transcript and variant that you're looking at. Moving on to the microscope, um, again, I can't stress enough on the importance of setting the microscope right at the beginning for sterilized methods. So usually we do recommend uh, for those who are new to this technology to start with a wild field fluorescence microscope. Although I do understand nowadays, if you go to imaging core, you, are, you can readily find a confocal microscope, but because of the illumination method that I use and the light intensity that I use, we don't normally recommend you start with confocal. Um, we always recommend to start with the basic one, like the wild field fluorescence microscope. Although some of our more advanced or more experienced customer does um, get asterisk images with confocal microscope as well, but we always advise to start with a wide field um, first. Um, and if we look at this, of course, um, filter sets is always very uh, important to look at what are the filter sets that your particular microscope has. So that allows you to choose the um, appropriate combinations of um, the dye if you are doing a multiplex um, assays. We don't normally recommend to use the fan um, because a lot, really depending on what cell you are looking at, a lot of times, uh, especially of um, tissues, they might give up very um, high autofluorescence background that is usually in that green channel. Um, so we do uh, realize that you know, if you're using FAM, that potentially will give you um, quite a bit of um, background signal as well, especially working with those cell types that has higher autofluorescence. Um, if you're working with um, transcripts that are not abundantly expressed, then we will recommend to go for a dye that is bright enough and don't photo bleach that easily. For example, our proprietary Prisa 570, as well as the Cowflow Red um, 610. So these are pretty good dyes with uh, very strong intensity and don't bleach easily. Um, so moving on to some of the specific specs for um, the microscope that you use, um, we will usually recommend on a higher um, magnification lens about 60 to 100 X, while you can potentially get you know, your nuclei, you know, your cells under 10 X or 20 X, but bear in mind that we are looking at a single uh, molecule of RNA, which is very tiny and 60, if you only start with 10, 10 X, 20 X, chances are you're going to get an out of focus um, images for that RNA transcript. So we recommend starting with 10 X, 20 X, you'll find your uh, DAPI uh, stained nuclei to, to begin with. And then under the same um, XYZ setting, then you change to the 60 to 100 X in an oil immersion objective. Usually in your macro aperture is more than 1.3 um, so that you will be able to get a relatively good um, resolution of the single molecule of RNAs. 
Um, and in terms of the um, XY stage, as I mentioned, um, this is again a single molecule, um, and we do recommend to have a motorized XYZ stage, which many of the uh, microscopes nowadays comes with. So as you um, scan through the different thing layers, so that you can later sort of combine all those to stack them together, what we call it as Z-stack, so that you will be able to capture your RNA transcript across the different layers if possible to give you a very nice image. Again, just imagine uh, maybe of a, for example, 30 story building and each level you might have your RNA. If you are not moving up this 30 story, sometimes you might not be able to get the RNA transcripts which are not abundantly expressed. So we will always recommend to go through the C stack um, at a recommended um, you know, thing size so that you could probably get a very good um, signals for your RNA uh, transcript images. Right, so these are the key things that I want to stress here on this slide. Again, I spend a lot of time because this is really the first critical step. If you don't get the microscope setting correct, you will not be able to get a, a publication ready or stellar um, sterilized images. Again, just to you know, help our new customers who might be new to this technologies to get this right, uh, we have newly launched a sort of universal control for Stellaris. It's essentially a T30 dye coupled oligo um, that will bind to the poly A tail um, so that um, it will act as a pretty good sort of controls, positive controls, depending on the dye that you use, um, just to make sure the setting is correct before you move on to your own transcript of interest. So again, um, here is uh, taken from our getting start um, guidelines where you can see some of the recommendations for the positive and negative controls. Personally, I will always recommend to get your positive control and negative control working before you embark on your own project. This is to make sure that your workflow, your protocol, your setting is working fine before you move on to your actual projects. And on the right hand side, um, this is um, from our website. Um, this is the universal controls with the different um, dye combinations that we offer. So you can take a look at it um, and you can use those um, to initially make sure um, to optimize um, your experimental settings. So as I mentioned um, previously, Stellaris is a very um, fascinating technology where a punk tape signal does indicate one single um, mRNA or RNA transcript. So in that case, you know, a lot of customers are very interested to look at how they can quantitate the expression levels. And there's actually a lot of different softwares um, that's uh, outside in the market. Um, here are just a few examples um, that we have seen in the publications. Um, so in BioSearch, we do use quite a lot um, from this, um, using the start search, as I mentioned, um, this is developed by Arjun Raj at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so the group is one of the co-developers for this technology as well. Um, do understand that start search might be currently undergoing some um, upgrade and development. Um, so you might not be able to find that in the website, but um, Raj's team does offer another um, software, um, probably a bit of um, a MATLAB type of languages needed. Um, but nonetheless, there is also other uh, widely used um, image processor like ImageJ that you, you can potentially use to analyze your star's image data. So again, this is just a showcase about how they do spot counting in the start search uh, website. Again, I provided the link here. If anyone is interested, you can potentially go to the website and look for their software information there. So it just basically um, you know, tells you how you can actually analyze the data on the spot intensities and count how many spots you have uh, from those um, settings. So moving on to probe set verifications. Um, so again, you know, when you um, start your experiments, you get your very nice data, but you ask question, is the signal that I get is really the mRNA or RNA um, that I'm looking at? And when you submit your images you know, for publication, that's probably one of the reviewer's questions as well. How do you make sure that this signal is actually from the RNA of interest? Right, so that, that's why I said it's always very important to start with positive and negative control. And some other um, techniques, um, as I shared here, um, some of the customers, um, they're actually using 
a two color approach where in a set of 48 um, probes, they will use two different colors to label the odd and the even ones. So let's say the odd ones are all labeled um, with the red, even numbered um, probes are labeled with the green. So if you look at, because of the um, diffraction limit, anything that is within the 200 nanometer will actually appear as one. So ideally they should uh, be co-localized and you will see orange color. So, you know, some of you might question why I see two different dots. Um, this is because um, this image was sort of uh, processed um, so that these two dots are uh, essentially supposed to be overlaid, but just, you know, for the sake of explanation to let you understand, you know, this is usually how it happens um, in that particular setting. Um, some other tips, um, you know, to test for specificity, you know, you can potentially, um, you know, do silencing or trend over expression, uh, for example, just to see, you know, if any of the expression got changed with that method. Uh, if you are questioned about, you know, whether you are detecting RNA specifically and not uh, any other, um, you know, targets like DNA or others, then you can treat with RNAs to see if the signals goes goes down. And another way is also to use a cell line or a non-relevant organism that is not supposed to express a particular uh, uh, genes and then you can um, then demonstrate that you know the RNA starts RNA doesn't pick up um, those in that particular samples. Um, I've talked about autofluorescence. Again, you can use a node probe controls to check for autofluorescence. You can usually use fit C uh, filter. For example, if it's not used, you can um, see the different um, samples to see if they do give you signals, uh, even in the non-probe controls under the FITC filter. And if they do, most likely they're background signals. And um, in terms of the sequence, as I mentioned, um, just be aware of splice variants. Um, so be clear, are you looking at overall um, at the RNA level or are you looking at the different uh, splicing variant? Um, there's also designed um, sort of tips um, to adjust the masking levels, for example, to um, make sure that you avoid some of the high GC content and repetitive um, sequences um, so that you will get a set um, that will bind at similar temperatures, um, as well as um, to avoid those uh, potentially targeting the pseudogenes, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of um, other tips um, that you can get um, from our start guide. Um, so I do encourage you all to review those if you are new to this technology. So, so hopefully that gives you a brief overview about how this technology works. What are some of the tips and tricks uh, to make sure your experiments is set up properly and how to troubleshoot if it doesn't. Um, moving on in the next couple of minutes, I just wanted to share some of the um, new um, exciting development that we have seen in the past three years during COVID um, that's being uh, reported in customer publications. Um, of course, you're know, talking about COVID, there's a lot of um, studies out there on the viral um, genomic RNA, on the messenger RNA, and I'll also be talking about some of the interesting um, new development like fish, um, combining fish with flow cytometries, and of course, looking at alternative splicing, normal coding RNA, et cetera, et cetera. So again, starting with uh, one of the recent publications um, to detect the SARS-CoV-2 genomic, um, a viral genomic RNA uh, within the infected cells. So here you can see that you know, they actually verify the probe set um, by using the odd and even approach. You can see they are targeting the um, SARS-CoV-2 um, overreading frame 1A uh, with the probes and even number probes you can see they label with a blue color and another one and they label with a red color. And when those two colors co-localize, they sort of demonstrate that indeed, this is specifically binding to that same transcript. Um, and um, then once validating that yes, indeed, um, the steroids is binding to the target, um, then they went on ahead with their own experiments, um, those sort of treat um, their infected cells with RNAs or a specific inhibitor that they are starting to see, you know, how good it sort of to reduce the replications of the uh, virus. Um, so essentially it's the viral polymerase inhibitors. 
and you can see that by um by looking at the probe signal, um, you can see that it actually um, decreases the intensity when you treat um, those infected cells with a specific inhibitors or a general RNAs. Again, just showing that the drug is indeed working uh, to stop the replications and on the same time, um, once again, confirming specificity as well. So that's one uh, interesting example on detecting the SARS-CoV-2 RNA within infected cells. Another one uh, I sort of sharing uh, is the flow fish. Again, they're also looking at the genomic RNA, but again, they are combining with a flow cytometry. So um, apart from just fluorescent microscopy data, um, they are also um, using flow cytometry in this particular case on the BD um, VEX caliber and analyze with flow gel so you can see the nice um, expressions um, using the flow data um, um, histograms as well. So just to point out um, that flow fish is an interesting technology that was actually um, developed initially by uh, some of the collaborators. Um, and if you wanted to know more about you know, how that is being done, you know, what sort of sequence they do, um, you know, to let's say stain on the surface um, protein cells that you can um, tag those cells, looking at a specific immuno cell that you're looking at, for example. Um, so if you want to know at the detailed protocol on how they do all the staining and hybridizations and analysis, I do encourage you to uh, refer to the very first um, publications on the nature protocols. Uh, but just bear in mind that this is a um, application that is developed by customers. Um, and as we don't necessarily have an imaging flow cytometries um, in our biosearch facility, so our support for um, this applications is relatively limited. But um, we will be happy to link you up with the um, collaborators, with our collaborators who has developed this technology, should you need to discuss more about how um, you can carry out the fish flow. All right, so previously we're looking at COVID. Again, now when COVID subsides, now we are realizing we have, you know, um, a peaks of uh, the flu, you know, flu is back after three years. So here is an interesting um, paper. Um, looking at the influenza viral RNA um, as well as the mRNA localization. So they are interested to study some small molecules that target the certain uh, nuclear proteins of the virus and see if that um, helps to reduce the viral load. So here um, you can see the uh, fish data. Um, again, they were combined with uh, immunoimagins and to visualize the migrations of the viral nuclear proteins and also more importantly, the distribution of the viral RNA as well as the messaging RNA of that particular um, proteins under the inference of inhibitors. So you can see that under the wild type um, nuclear protein with um, the drug treatment, that actually has decreased um, trans, I would say distribution from nucleus to the cytoplasm. But when you substitute that with a mutant that is not subject to the action of the small molecules that you no longer see that happening. So again, this is a very uh, strong demonstrations about um, the effect of drug and you can use Cyrus to look at both the expression levels as well as the co-localizations um, of the viral as well as the messenger um, RNAs in this particular case. All right, um, this is the last one in terms of the RNA side of the world for COVID and you know, flu related. We do notice apart from all the you know, flu uh, virus, COVID virus, there's also a lot of development around the RNA therapeutics. So here is a um, publications um, from AstraZeneca. They are looking at some novel RNA therapeutics um, and they're using stars to quantitatively looking at intracellular retention of that delivered RNAs um, using that approach. Um, so if you are um, you know, looking at RNA therapeutics development as well in your lab, um, then this might be a good reference point to take a look at it. All right, so that is on the mRNA and RNA therapeutics and vaccine development. Moving on, um, just to share some additional examples, on the um, ice fish, um, so it actually stands for intron chromosomal expressions. Um, and this is just showing how the ice fish is being used um, for fusion gene detection. And again, this is a poster that was presented um, back um, a few years ago, um, prior to COVID, 
um, during the AACR meeting. And again, it's in collaboration with the Korean company, um, Trinomics, um, I believe, uh, where they are interested to look at EML and uh, fusion proteins, look at both pre uh, um, mRNA as well as the uh, mRNAs, and they utilize um, specific design approach so that they could look at um, the fusion between the two proteins um, in those um, different settings. Again, the images might be a bit difficult to see, but if you zoom in, um, you will be able to see some of the co-localizations of the intronic uh, EML uh, for five prime RNA, which is in green, with the intronic EML for three prime RNA in this case, as well as the fusion one where the EML for five prime RNA in green uh, was fused with ELK three prime RNA in blue. So this is a, another example, uh, more relevant to the cancer group um, who might be interested to look at the fusion gene detection. And um, again, sharing some more protocols, um, a faster sort of uh, workflow. So this is called TurboFish, again, you know, developed by Raj Lab in um, UPenn. Um, so they sort of have optimized a protocol um, for a very rapid single molecule RNA fish uh, by utilizing a higher probe concentration. So on this graph here, you can just see the sort of the threshold sensitivities um, for a particular mRNA they're looking at uh, with varying concentrations of probe as well as um, the um, lens of the hybridization. So they were sort of tested to the extreme that if you increase some of the probe concentration that you might be able to achieve the similar level of um, sensitivities uh, within a much shorter time frame. All right, so these hopefully um, give you a sort of taste into some of the new development in, in terms of applications in mRNA vaccines, RNA therapeutics, um, as well as some of the newer protocols to look at various uh, splice variants, as well as a faster protocol, um, or to combine it with uh, flow cytometry. So just to summarize um, some of the key technical advantages, I just want to re-emphasize, Steraris is a technology that it's proprietary that utilizes this you know, more than 25 to uh, 48 sort of process that bind to a single transcript. It is a more um, accurate way of quantifying the transcript at a single um, at a single molecule level, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's brighter because um, of the depression limit as well as no amplification methods that's used. If you look at um, in the market, there may be some other technologies out there uh, which uses amplifications to enhance the, the signals. They might be much brighter, but don't necessarily mean it's more accurate um, because there is secondary amplification that's uh, involved. Um, like um, what I shared um, and images they will see, um, this RNA fish is compatible with uh, immunofluorescence. So if you're looking at both mRNA as well as at the protein level, just to understand, yes, indeed, uh, the protein has been expressed. Um, and there's also a good way to sort of differentiate the different cell lines as well. So here is an example um, of a particular type of um, breast uh, carcinoma cells, which has overexpression of the HER2 protein. Um, at the cell surface, and it's a good illustration about you know the uh, mRNA really gets uh, translated and being um, you know transported um, on the surface um, to to have that purple ring. Um, if you look at um, the graph here, and for those who might be looking at multiple targets, um, this is also an easy way um, to direct multiplex. So here, just showing the different type of colors that you can use. Um, people usually use dark stains, so it's the blue for the DNAs, um, and then you can use different colors, um, you know, essentially um, depending on the filter that you have for your microscope, but usually, uh, you know, a four or five plaques shouldn't be much a problem uh, for a modern microscope. We've also seen some advanced publications where, um, you know, combining with the flow um, and the custom dyes, um, they might be able to stretch it to a a quite a high level of multiplexing as well. And for the last few slides, I'm just going to go quickly um, to go over some of the product specifics um, and the resources page that you can look out for. There are three uh, different type of essays that we offer. Um, you know, you can use the online designer, which is free of charge, um, to design the probes of interest. Um, so this is 
usually the custom design uh, deliver as five nanomole of uh, low flies oligos uh, in dried and then just resubstitute it. Um, there's also what we call as ship ready probes. Again, these are normally used as positive control um, or you know, internal control where most of those uh, proteins are very highly um, expressed like GAP-DH in this particular cases. These are um, validated control probe sets and people usually order them um, you know, as a positive control or as a first experiment just to make sure the settings is correct. And there's also this called design ready probe sets. Um, these are bioinformatically um, verified. Uh, we have more than 4,000 professionally designed make to order, uh, make -to -order probe sets. Um, just do bear in mind they are inclusive, meaning that they're designed to include all the RNA variants from the target gene. If you're interested to look at the different splice variants, um, then you will probably need to have exclusive uh, design uh, sort of um, algorithm applied, and then you'll go through the custom route. And for the design ready, um, it's currently available for more than 20 organisms. Um, just bear in mind that these are bioinformatically validated, but not wet lab validated, um, but do rest assured they have many um, users who use those design ready process and they have lots of publications. So if you want doubt, you can always check and see if that particular um, design ready probe has been used by other customers with, um, you know, in, in particular cell line or tissue type that you're working with. And one last point, again, just wanted to highlight, uh, we do have some proprietary um, reagent that is added into our sterilized RNA fish buffers that is um, quite different um, compared to the conventional RNA fish buffers. And it does make a distance, a difference if you um, look at here. So this does allow you to have a sharper image, uh, redu um, you know, increased signal to noise ratio with um, the RNA fish buffer that we recommend. Um, if you want to know more about the technical details, I would highly encourage you to go to our BioSearch Bio website, the resources page. There is um, different RNA fish protocols on the different organisms. Um, there is also a very extensive FAQs, uh, which will be very helpful um, as a beginner to go through some of the common mistakes or the common questions that um, users uh, really ask. There's also a whole list of different blog articles, both from technical tips, for example, uh, about setting how to set up your microscope, how do you acquire the image, how do you go through the de-stacking, as well as post uh, acquisition image analysis, you know, how do you set the right settings so you can get the nice images. I do highly recommend um, the users to go and look for those technical resources. There is also some nice um, publication digest on some of the um, novel and interesting um, applications that I mentioned about, um, for example, Flowfish, um, the fusion gene detection, long long coding RNA, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of resources in that. And uh, it will be a good resource to start with um, if you are embarking on this new technology. So with that, I would just like to end here. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. You can always reach out to me um, at this email address. If you have more specific technical related questions, you can always reach out to tech support and we will have someone um, get back to you with regards to your questions. So with that, I am just going to stop here and see if there's any questions.